Professor Martin Prince, many thanks for taking part in this spotlight on COVID-19 video. We'd like to talk today about your involvement in the analysis on the rates of COVID-19 infection in sub-Saharan Africa and to get some insight into the health challenges faced by these countries during the pandemic. First of all, could you tell us a little bit about your work at King's College London and your role there? So for the last two years, I've been the director of our new King's Global Health Institute. Um, and the idea behind the Institute was actually to bring together uh, a set of researchers and clinicians from a wide range of different disciplines, and in particular, including arts, humanities and social sciences, as well as epidemiology, public health uh, and clinical areas, including maternal health, uh, palliative care, chronic diseases. Thank you. And in your role at the King's Global Health Institute, you're part of ASSET. Can you tell us about ASSET and the work it has been doing during the pandemic? So this is a global health research unit funded by NIHR, the National Institute for Health Research um, in the UK as part of the donor assistance for health um, that the UK contributes to quite generously. Uh, and we work on health system strengthening in sub-Saharan African countries. Specifically, we've been focusing on four countries, uh, which is Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, South Africa and Zimbabwe. So we cover the South, the East and the West um, of the continent. Um, what we've been looking at is how a health systems weak, why a health systems weak, and in what specific ways can health systems be um, strengthened in order to provide care that is more accessible uh, and of higher quality? Um, with regard to what we've been doing during ASSET, we faced uh, an immediate challenge. We were actually just at the stage where we'd worked with our partners towards developing um, analysing the situation, developing uh, health system strengthening solutions, and we were about to implement those and evaluate their effectiveness. Um, but clearly this isn't appropriate at a time when health systems have been fundamentally impacted um, by COVID in just the way, the same way as in high income countries. So people no longer attend primary health care. Um, surgery is only for the really most acute and urgent conditions, even maternity care. Uh, is now being run at a much lower level um, than before. So we had to radically rethink our plans and uh, uh, essentially we've done two things, one of which is to uh, develop a kind of um, observatory or dashboard in which every day we look um, in detailed focus uh, at all of the parameters of the outbreak in the 46 sub-Saharan African countries, so not just the four where we're working, uh, looking at how the pandemic has developed uh, and what might be the determinants of slower or more rapid development and how these countries are coping with the numbers of affected people through the critical care and hospital care that they have to provide. But we've also um, been looking at the um, maternal, surgical and integrated primary health care um, platforms with the partners with whom we've been working. Uh, and we've been, uh, although research is actually very difficult, um, we've realised that, for example, TB care in South Africa has been seriously impacted um, by COVID. So although people are encouraged to access care for TB, the new TB diagnosis rates have plummeted um, in the Eastern Cape where we're working um, in that country. And so the question now becomes, uh, why is that? Uh, and what under these kind of circumstances where a serious shock occurs to a health system can be done to try and make it more resilient in the first place and to try and actually uh, actively promote and facilitate um, access to what is really essential care at the moment. Uh, we're doing the same thing with um, maternal care services uh, in Cape Town, again, with our local partners. Thank you. And you mentioned there that, that ASSA has been sharing this data on its, its COVID-19 dashboard and, and you have been blogging about some of the analysis as well. You touched there upon kind of some of the, the trends you're perhaps noticing. Are there any others that are particularly important and informative at this time? So I think the, the first thing to note is that in comparison to the experience of high income countries um, and countries in uh, South and Southeast Asia, 
Um, the epidemic appears to have been much slower to develop um, in sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, so although all 46 countries had reported cases um, by the middle of April, um, now, three months into the outbreak, um, still, although sub-Saharan Africa accounts for 14% of the world's population, um, we're actually only seeing about 1% of the total cases and about 0.6% uh, of the total deaths having occurred in that region. Um, and this seems to be for a mixture of different reasons. So um, interestingly, sub-Saharan African countries implemented uh, control measures much more rapidly um, than European or North American countries did. Uh, in fact, often they closed their borders, closed air traffic uh, before they'd even actually had their first case. And they introduced physical distancing measures, um, generally not lockdown, although a few countries like South Africa and Zimbabwe have attempted that. Lockdown is actually very difficult um, in these countries because uh, so many people are working in the informal economy and if they can't go out onto the streets to do the simple work that they do, they don't have an income, there isn't any social protection, they have to do something for their families. So instead, countries have often introduced things like nighttime curfews, what we call cordon sanitaire, where they actually close down a city or close down an affected town and say nobody can go in or nobody can go out. Uh, but life still goes on more or less as normal within the cordon. Um, uh, nighttime curfews have been used quite widely uh, and kind of partial lockdowns um, as well that allow economic activity uh, to continue. So the early introduction of all of these measures meant that in some countries the outbreak never seemed to really take off. Um, in others, after a few so-called imported cases from people coming in early on, uh, it seemed the country rapidly gained control um, and they kind of flattened the curve. Um, but even then, what we're seeing is that in countries that have shown a steady community transmission now for a couple of months, the rate of growth of the outbreak hasn't seemed to have been as rapid um, as in other countries. Our big concern with this is that this may to a large extent be because these countries just don't simply have the test kits and the testing capacity to be able to actually identify and record the infections that they're getting. So we're tending to see a steady uh, linear pattern of growth rather than an exponential um, growth curve. Um, and this can have serious consequences for these countries because, as uh, Dr Tedros from the WHO said, uh, if you're not able to test, you're fighting in the dark. Um, you can't effectively control transmission. You can't encourage people to isolate. Um, and it means often that people are getting really sick, presenting late uh, for care when they get respiratory problems, which potentially then um, increases the um, uh, the risk of, uh, of bad outcomes, including including death. Um, and effectively, the problem seems to be here, not that these countries don't have the infrastructure to do the testing. Um, it's not that they don't have the money uh, to buy the tests, but essentially the global market for tests are is broken. High income countries have, have cornered this market and uh, their uh, demand for test kits seems not to be decreasing even as the epidemics begin to resolve. Um, so it's left many sub-Saharan African countries in a really difficult position, not only with test kits, but with other necessary equipment, including personal protective equipment, um, ventilators and other um, requirements for providing critical care. So there's a, a growing concern um, about uh, equity in what is, after all, literally global. This is a pandemic. The entire world is affected. Um, and we're not through this until every country has resolved its problems. So not only is there um, a really strong case around just social justice, fairness, um, that the global stock um, of these resources needs to be distributed uh, a lot more equitably. But also, actually, it makes rational good sense. There's no point controlling the epidemic in our countries um, if it isn't controlled elsewhere. We would then need to remain perpetually watchful uh, and always at risk 
of second, third, fourth waves of infection. Thank you. And you mentioned there kind of issues around inequity and social injustice and that this is very much a global problem. How do you hope and how is your research informing the response to the pandemic, both within sub-Saharan Africa and at the level of international decision making? Yeah, so I think these were early days and uh, at the moment we're, we're trying to do two things really. We're trying to learn from the data regarding what that may show about the effectiveness of control measures. And I think um, already what's emerging, it's difficult to demonstrate formally, um, but those sub-Saharan African countries that implemented really early and rigorous control, and this isn't only the physical distancing measures like um, you know, banning mass gatherings, closing schools and lockdown. Um, but I think absolutely critically, it's what we didn't do here in the UK, for example, um, which is close the borders um, and actually introduce uh, a, a rigorous quarantine for all visitors that you did let into the country, you know, 14 days supervised quarantine. This has been more or less universal uh, across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I think this has effectively really limited the size of the outbreaks at uh, a very early stage. Um, what the, the data that we're looking at so far seems to indicate is that actually beyond that, um, the strictness of the lockdown doesn't seem to have actually made such a lot of difference. South Africa that introduced the lockdown, um, you know, practically, let's see, we're um, end of June, beginning of July now, introduced the lockdown seven or eight weeks ago, has not seen a diminution um, in the increase in new cases in their country, which universally in Europe we did. We put a lockdown in place, two weeks later, cases starting reducing. I think these contexts are very, very different. Um, people live in very overcrowded uh, conditions, and this is where the outbreak has been spreading like wildfire. Um, nine or 10 people per house, if you lock people in their houses, um, they're more likely then to infect other people living in the same house with them, their neighbours. Um, it creates a huge amount of socioeconomic hardship, um, which many of these countries are trying, but you know, they have a limited capacity to be able to mitigate uh, the economic consequences for their population. So I think kind of understanding what works most effectively is important now um, and important for the future, because obviously we were all of us feeling our way with this at the outset. There's no doubt uh, Africa is so different. Um, you know, probably low income countries generally are so different. Uh, one size fits all solutions. Um, are not going to be the appropriate way to go. Thank you. So a really broad and in-depth range of activity that's going in there. Thank you. Th thank you very much. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Thank you.